Please be seated. Veuillez vous asseoir. The court is now in session. L'audience est ouverte. Ms. Sakovati, could you report the attendance of the parties and individuals to today's proceedings? Mr. President, all parties to today's proceedings are present. As for Nguyen Chi, he is present in the holding cell downstairs. That is based on the decision of the trial chamber due to his health. De la chambre, the expert who is going to continue to testify, that is Mr. Short, he is present Monsieur in the courtroom. Thank you. Présent, et President, euh, thank nous you. Allons poursuivre sa déposition. The Le floor is now given merci. to the prosecution la to comment putting questions to this witness, to this expert. You may proceed. Sans questionnement de l'expert. Vous avez la parole. Way Hood. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, everyone in and around the courtroom. Bonjour à tous. Good morning, Mr. Short. Bonjour, Monsieur Short. My name is Wayne Hood. Je Wayne I'm Hood. representing the office of the co-prosecutors. Co I have some questions for you. J'ai un certain nombre de questions à vous poser. My questions are related to the policy of the Communist Party of Cambodia as well as its ideology. After I conclude my portion, my colleague, Mr. Tariq Abdul Ha, will focus Quand on the historical terminé, development and evolution of these uh, policies. My questions are mainly based on portions of Mes your book, which is entitled Pol Pot, The Anatomy Pol of Pot, a Nightmare. The document has a code name E3 slash 9 as indicated by Judge Cartwright yesterday. As your book has not been translated into the Khmer language, I would use the English and the French reference of your book. You described in your book the significance of the decisions which, according to your book, were made in May 1975 at the Silver Pagoda. That is pages 8 and 9 of your book with the EAN in English 00 39 The French EAN is 00 9460 For that portion you wrote quote, In this surreal setting the habitants of the world's most radical revolution took the fateful decision after 10 days of discussion to disband the so-called United Front with CNU's supporters and other non-communist groups. 
who had helped them to win power. To criticize the relatively moderate policies that such an alliance implied, and instead to make the leap, the extremely marvelous, extremely wonderful, religious leap, as the Khmer expression has it, to install in one fell swoop full communism without compromise or concessions. The die had been cast. And on page 12, that is English EN 0039 and EN in French is 00639465. Jew wrote, quote, in any violent upheaval, whether war or revolution, innocent people suffer. U.S. officials speak of collateral damage. Maoists talk of breaking eggs in order to make an omelette. In the democratic Cambodia, collateral damage knew no bounds. Everything outside the revolution became a legitimate and necessary target. It was not simply that life had no value, that killing became an act of no consequence. and entire country was put in thrall to a dystopian ideal that negated anything and everything that was human." End of quote. I have a number of questions here for you, Mr. Short. J'aimerais vous poser quelques questions à ce sujet, Mr. Short. First, can I ask you to expand on your use of the term, quote, the world's most radical revolution, end of quote? No other communist party anywhere, uh, neither in North Korea, nor in China, nor in any of the Soviet bloc states, has attempted to uh, go so quickly and so completely towards a communist state as defined by, by Marx, true communism, uh, a state of complete equality, and indeed a, a state where the apparatus of the state withers away. Uh, one of the characteristics of democratic Cambodia was that the government apparatus, and indeed the apparatus of the party were reduced to a minimum, where there was no compromise with realities in terms of creating this equal, property, propertyless, in the sense of private property, polity. In that sense, um, Pol Pot and the Cambodian Communist Party pushed the logic of communism to its extreme, and the result, uh, as you know, was a terrible catastrophe. In your opinion, 
and based on your research into the history of the movement, sur la base de vos recherches concernant l'histoire du mouvement, Did the decisions made in May 1975 represent a significant departure from past practices? Or was there any relationship between the May 1975 decisions and CPK policies and practices that had been in existence in the liberated areas in the early 1970s? If you look at the development of China after 1949, uh, the first stage was what Mao called new democracy. Where the Communist Party cooperated with non communist elements, with private business. And for five or six years, uh, there was what one might term a, a very moderate form of communism. It then became more radical uh, and more extreme. In Cambodia, uh, the decision taken in May was not to do that. Uh, was it ever a serious option that the Cambodian Communist Party could have practiced the equivalent of new democracy? That is, was it ever a serious option that the DK regime could have cooperated with non-communist elements? I think not, because precisely of, of the development before. Already in the provinces, there were examples of a transition to a, an essentially property-less property society. Money had been done away with. Um, th that is, the currency of the long null government was, was not used. Uh, there was a degree of collectivization. There were steps in that, in that direction. What the May meeting decided was that the leap into what one might call pure communism, utopian communism, should be direct and immediate. And I think that was not necessarily, that need not have been the case. There could have been a more gradual transition, even if the goal would always have been the same. Based on your Question. response, I take it that the May 1975 en decisions meant there was still a relationship and practices since the early 1970s. Am I correct on this point? Allow me to repeat my question based on your response. I take it that based on your response, the decisions made in May 1975 followed the practices since early 1970s. Am I correct on this point? Yes, uh, I was waiting to answer, but I could not answer until the microphone switches off. Um, yes, you are correct. Uh, there is definitely a relationship between um, uh, what happened after April 1975, including the decision at, decisions at the Silver Pagoda, and what had happened before. But it was not a fatal connection. It didn't have to happen in quite the way it did. 
Certainly, it would have happened eventually because that was the direction in which Khmer Rouge policy was pointing, but it didn't have to happen so fast. That was a decision that they took. Thank you, Mr. Short. Question. Merci, Monsieur Short. In the book you wrote, quote, everything outside the revolution became a legitimate and necessary target. Est devenu End une cible fault. légitime et nécessaire. Fin de citation. Allow me to ask you first, what if any implications did this direction have on the relationship between the CPK and its former front allies? The decision, uh, the decisions taken in May meant that the front was essentially no longer useful. So the question then became, how uh, does the CPK uh, govern or manage its relations with the front? How does it bring that stage of the revolution to an end? and start, as it did in 1976, the pure DK system. Um, it, because CNUC represented those who were outside the revolution. Prince CNUC, uh, the, the members of the front, uh, those who were not uh, from the CPK core. So the decision to leap towards a, a radical communist state meant that that would all have to come to an end. Also, regarding Question. that decisions, Toujours au sujet de ces décisions, that is the decision to smash. La décision d'écraser. So the, the question that I really would like the response from you is whether that relation, that decision, had any relationship between its former si allies. Yes, indeed. Uh, the, the former allies being those who were non-communist elements in the front, the, 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 the decisions in May, the consequence of the decisions in May was that that relationship was, should not continue as it had. It had to be changed uh, because all power would be in the hands of the CPK core. And it no longer needed to be dressed up as a front with non-communist elements. So uh, the destitution of uh, uh, the decision to, uh, to, to uh, pr promulgate a new constitution, which was taken at the end of 1975, and the consequences of that constitution, which were, were uh, CNU uh, resigned, uh, the front ended, that all followed from the decisions in May. Tout cela était suite aux décisions prises au mois de mai. Thank you, Mr. Short. Now I move question. on to another question. Merci. Je passe à une autre question. I like to understand more about the policy, there is this uh, policy to smash. Cette, uh, politique, uh, did this policy affect ordinary people outside the party ranks? That's the first point. And secondly, uh, did the, the, this policy party. in any way affect those within the ranks? The policy to smash was to smash those who uh, were not 
wholeheartedly with the revolution was, if you like, a corollary, um, a, a, a parallel facet to what we have just been discussing, the fact that people outside the revolution, people in the front, were no longer necessary for the next stage. Now, why were people smashed? Why were people uh, suspected? I think you, you touch there on one of the, the, the very fundamental aspects of Khmer Rouge ideology. Individualism, asking questions about the regime, was a form of mental private property because it meant you had your own personal ideas which were different from those of the organization, different from those of ANCA. And private property, whether mental or material, was a sign of potential opposition, of being outside the revolution, of being part of them, those outside, rather than us within. So any kind of questioning, of uh, showing of uh, private views, of personal views, was taken to be in opposition to the revolution, whether at the highest levels or lower down, or among ordinary people. And because this was a revolution which refused to admit doubt or uncertainty, those who showed uh, different views, private views, as against the collective view, were liable, in the end, to be smashed. Thank you, Mr. Short. Question. Merci, Mr. Short. Now, coming back to your book, and it is in the same Pour section we looked at earlier, you deal with the abolition of individual rights under the regime. Uh, that is on page 11 of your book, English EN 0039-62-03, French EN 0063-94-62, says the prosecutor. You wrote, quote, money, law court, newspapers, the postal system and foreign telecommunications, even the, even the concept of the city were all simply abolished. Individual rights were not curtailed in Les favor of the collective, pas été but extinguished all together. Individual creativity, initiative, originality were condemned per se. Individual consciousness was systematically demolished. End of quote. Fin de citation. My question is the following. Voici In your expert opinion, vous, what was the policy expert, reason for the abolition of the of extinguishing individual rights? Because if you have individual rights, like individual opinions, Parce like si individual property, people are not equal. Uh, and 
I didn't have this from Mr. Q. Sampan himself, but uh, I was uh, I talked to uh, uh, an official, um, an official of actually the present government, who attended a seminar given by Mr. Q. Sampan, at which he said that. Uh, if one person had a little more and another si person a little less, that was not communism. The only way to ensure communism, the implication at least, was that everyone must have the same, and that meant everyone having nothing in terms chose, of private property. Dire, uh, Now, that was applied uh, mentally as well as in terms uh, of material possessions. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Short. Question. Merci, Mr. Short. What was the approach of the Khmer Rouge to family life, and in Comment particular the right for families to stay together and for children to be with their parents? The fundamental position was that the true family was the organization and not the nuclear family of parents, grandparents, and children. Therefore, family relations within the family. I don't want to be too dogmatic about this because there were great differences depending on where you lived in Cambodia and what policies were followed by the local officials. But insofar as there was a central line, it was that family ties must not be allowed to interfere with the greater loyalty of each individual, each, each person to the communist cause, to the organization ANCA. The result was that very little weight was placed on family relations to the extent that marriages uh, which took place uh, under the, the Khmer Rouge period were often between soldiers, let us say, and uh, 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 young women, uh, uh, essentially for the practical purpose of creating children which would form part of the population. The romantic attachment between a couple was something that the Khmer Rouge had very little time for. Continuing on this uh, theme, I would like to explore the abolition uh, in relation to what you have written in your book uh, of courts or legal system. And uh, the 1975 to 1979 regime. Yesterday, Judge uh, Cartwright asked you uh, the question, and you said uh, that uh, the uh, court of law was uh, completely abolished at 1.45 uh, second at yesterday. So now I would like uh, to ask you to expand on this. Uh, have you ever been able to form a view as to why CPK policy warranted the abolition of la law du PCK courts? Yes, I have. Uh, and I would like to say that it seems to me that oui, the abolition of law courts was completely logical in terms of CPK policy. Because the only purpose effet, of a law court 
un tribunal est à juger de manière indépendante. The idea of, of of anything being independent of the party was abhorrent to the CPK. Therefore, why have law courts? Et donc, pourquoi avoir des tribunaux? The, the party itself le parti would decide, -même and les uh, anything else would be hypocritical. Uh, law courts only make sense in, in a totally different kind of democratic system. Hypocrite. So, no Car courts. Des tribunaux ont un sens uniquement dans un système démocratique. Thank you, Mr. Short. Question. I have an additional question on this uh, particular theme. In the absence of the law courts, did any system of justice replace the law courts? And what were the hallmarks of that system? I think it, in, in the terms which we would normally use, it would be difficult to apply the word justice. There was a, a system whereby uh, those who were suspected of disloyalty would be denounced uh, to the, the village or the collective leaders and would often be taken to the district prison. In some cases, they might be released if it were felt by those running the prison that there were no, uh, that they were not irredeemably uh, guilty, that they need not be killed. In, the, in many, many cases, they would simply be killed. In some cases, uh, the decision would be taken at the uh, collective level, and they would be killed without being taken to the district prison. In yet other cases, they might be sent to S21, to Phnom Penh, to the center of the Santibar, and there they would be interrogated là, and then killed. I, I'm not sure that you can really call this a system of Je justice. Si it was a system uh, of elimination of those who, on whom suspicion had fallen. But soupçonnés. no more than that. Mais rien de plus. Thank you, Mr. Short. Merci, Monsieur Short. Now I would like uh, to turn uh, to à présent, a concept. I think uh, you are an expert. You will be able to explain uh, this notion, based on your extensive research. En tant ayant effectué de vastes recherches. Can you explain uh, some of the various uh, reasons below, as below. If the entire country, in Je they, the leadership failed to pays, uphold the system of justice, si or they allow the abolition of the law courts, uh, si what would be the consequences of the abolition of such justice system? The consequences are what we saw, but again, I would say, uh, in, in given the, the, the ideology of the Cambodian Communist Party, uh, it was both to be expected and flowed naturally from the, the guiding ideology. That is, uh, you, you had a system where there was considerable arbitrariness at the lower levels in, in, in the provinces, but where all decision-making regarding the country as a whole was taken by a very small group of people in the standing committee, and essentially by Pol Pot himself, Nguyen Chia, and one or two others, depending on the subject.
Thank you, Mr. Schott. Question. Now I would like to turn to Merci, the Mr. issue Schott. concerning the abolition of money. À la suppression de Yesterday, Judge Cartwright Hier, asked you this question, vous and you responded. À ce sujet. Concerning the abolition of money, the policy, uh, the people dit, in general could not do anything. That's what you uh, told the court. So what I would like to expand on this uh, particular issue, cela, which I am not sure, and I need your um, enlightenment, I would like to know what policy or ideological considerations quelle underpin the decision by the Khmer Rouge leadership to abolish money after victory and to establish a system of cooperatives and enforced collectivization. I think the two, the two issues are different. Uh, collectivization happened in all communist countries to a greater or lesser degree. Tous les pays it did not, outside democratic Cambodia, it did not mean that money would be abolished. There was, in China, some aboli. very brief en discussion Chine, a of abolishing money during the Great Leap Forward at the end of the 1950s, and they decided not to do it. 50, Throughout the Chinese Communist regime, and le every régime other communist, communist regime, uh, autres, money has been used. On a uh, so why in Cambodia, Alors in Democratic Cambodia, did they decide to abolish money? Because, as I said earlier, Private bien, property dit, of any kind is a source of inequality. Privée, quelle qu and if, as one of your guiding principles, you are committed si to absolute equality, it et follows absolue, that money en découle, in, should not be used internally, because then one person has a little more, another has a little a less. They can buy different amounts of, of different products, and inequality follows. So if you're being completely single-minded in a kind of tunnel vision way, you say no money, no private property, complete equality. They were logical with themselves. That's what they did. But at the cost of enormous suffering, because people could not live anything remotely like normal lives. N'ont pas pu mener une vie normale très loin de là. I have another question concerning question. the decision relating to the establishment of a system of uh, cooperatives and uh, de mise en place enforced de uh, collectivization. De collectivization forcée. Judge Lavange yesterday uh, put this uh, question Hier, uh, to you, Lavergne and yesterday you also explained sujet. in relation to this aspect uh, that this, uh, the establishment of this system was to ensure equality. Now, for example, if we want it uh, to be uh, iron out in the same level to ensure social um, equality. I would like to um, ask you to explain, uh, following the establishment of a system of cooperatives, what are the rationale behind the establishment of uh, the system of cooperatives and collectivization? De la mise en place d'un système de coopératives et de collectivisation. Initially, uh, there were Au départ, a whole series of reasons. Il y a eu um, sorte de in, in, in communist systems, uh, collectively Dans owned property is held to be uh, more just, comme plus juste, uh, better for everybody concerned than private ownership and the exploitation of man by man, as in a inverted commas capitalist system. There was also the practical rationale, which we discussed yesterday, of controlling the rice supply, uh, preventing it uh, being uh, available to the Vietnamese allies, um, allies with, with problems. 
Uh, and then there is also the, the ideological element, which, which we've just been discussing, uh, the, the desire to uh, produce a, a system in which everybody was equal, which was not, I mean, there were good reasons or at least uh, worthy motives for it. It would raise up the poorest peasantry which again, as we heard yesterday, Pol Pot wished to make out were the majority of Cambodians. Pol Pot that, that was not true, but it was a justification advance. Vrai, and in the, the communist system, uh, as they conceived it, agricultural production was going to be the way in which democratic Cambodia developed, became uh, prosperous and strong, prospère, and therefore fort the more people donc, who could be put into collectives and made to work on the farms, the more agricultural production there would be, plus the stronger, the more quickly a strong rende, Cambodia would develop. Again, if I might just add one word, un mot, there was, this was not illogical, Cela there was a, a great deal uh, that made sense Beaucoup in this. The problem, the greatest problem, was in the Le way it was carried out. I mean, it, is, it is possible to imagine that a system of this kind uh, could have been just and fair and equitable and would have achieved many of its goals without the suffering that resulted from the way it was carried out des souffrances qui ont été le fruit de la manière dont on s'y est pris. I have uh, one last question for you. Question. Just now we uh, were discussing on the establishment of the Nous venons de parler de la mise yeah. en place policy of money abolition, abolition and a draft policy to establish a system of cooperatives and enforce de collectivization. De et de collectivization so how soon after the 17th of April 1975 was this 75, new policy implemented. Not in terms of the abolition of money, but in terms of collectivization and the, the, la monnaie, the, 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 the mass population movements into collectives. That happened immediately. Le de as soon as uh, vers des the Khmer Rouge had suite. attained victory, Après la victoire, all the cities were evacuated. Les ont été People were put to work in collectives. On a fait les gens the abolition of money, that decision was, was much slower. Monnaie, it's very difficult to de pinpoint Il est de uh, quite how it went. The fundamental decision was taken in la May at the Silver Pagoda, en mai à la Pagoda, but there was already at that time, uh, uh, move, there were already moves to put into place a banking system which would have allowed money to be used. Um, and uh, as I think we said yesterday, Specimen notes were taken to at least some collectives Des to be shown to people, this is the money that we're going to use. Pour montrer aux gens, en leur disant, Was it in June that utilisé? the word finally got juin, round, that no, no money is going to be used? Quoi, I, I, I don't know. It, it's hard to pinpoint that to a very precise date. The decision précis. was taken in May. May. So after that, it was Après finished. Cela, but it probably took Mais some weeks before the effects of that decision were made completely known everywhere. De cette décision ne soit pleinement connue de tous. Uh, Mr. Short, uh, thank you very much. I would Merci like to beaucoup, conclude Short. my line of questioning Je now, but I hand over the floor to my esteemed colleague, Mr. Tariq Abdul-Hak.
uh, to pursue uh, the question. Thank you, Mr. President. I have no further question for now. Good morning, Mr. President and Your Honours. Good morning, Council. Very good morning to you, Mr. Short. Uh, let me express on behalf of the prosecution team our gratitude for you coming uh, to Cambodia to testify. We appreciate this is your second trip. Uh, on the first occasion, we weren't very lucky. Um, I'm going to be ambitious and cover a, a, a rather wide range of topics with you today and, and tomorrow morning, and, and we'll be going as, as far as one can chronologically uh, through development of some of the policies that you've been describing. But I thought I'd start first uh, just by picking up on one uh, or two points that you, that you, that you just uh, been explaining uh, while these matters are still fresh in our mind. You talked about the concept of the destruction of, uh, of I, th I think you called it, mental uh, private property. And uh, in that context or, or in a different question, you discussed uh, a, a uh, education session that Q. Sampan gave that was described to you by, uh, by an individual you interviewed. Um, and I want to read to you a quote from the book and see if this is relevant and if this is indeed the, the passage you had in mind. Um, so this is at, pages, at page 316 of the book, the lower half of page 316. Uh, the English ERN is 00396527. Four, 24, French ERN 006387 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And this is that 70. quote. Exactly what was involved Je in changing your mentality le was made clear to the new arrivals at a month-long seminar les nouveaux venus conducted by Q. Saint-Pain. And then you quote. Ensuite, vous citez, the words attributed to him, Les mots qui lui sont how do we make a communist revolution, he asked us. The first thing you demandé, have to do is to destroy faire, private property. Le la but private property exists on both the material and the mental sur plane. Le plan matériel to destroy material private pour property, la the appropriate matériel, method la bonne was the evacuation of the towns. But spiritual private Mais property is more dangerous. dangerous. It comprises Elle everything that you think is yours. Comme nôtre. And then a little bit further down, Un peu plus bas, the next uh, subparagraph, the knowledge you have suivant, in your head your ideas Les connaissances are que vous avez dans votre esprit, too. vos idées sont également de la propriété privée mentale. Pour devenir un vrai révolutionnaire, vous devez that nettoyer votre esprit. Ce savoir provient des enseignements des colonialistes et des impérialistes, et il doit être anéanti. Est-ce là le passage auquel vous pensiez It is indeed. Réponse. Effectivement. Yes. And if I can just read another passage that Je vais lire follows un autre on after this quote. Qui uh, you dans la state, foulée. voici ce que vous dites. Sampan cautioned them that they should keep these ideas to les themselves a de because if the masses knew what we had been discussing, eux, parce que they si might become discouraged. De quoi on avait parlé, elles pourraient se décourager. The, uh, I should say for the, for the context, I think you uh, placed this event in late 1975. It was an educational session given to returning intellectuals. Um, and perhaps you can correct me if I've got the date wrong. Si je me la date. Can I ask you this, and, and perhaps you have already touched on this, but while we're dealing déjà with the specific question, uh, précis. Why was it so important to Pourquoi keep these ideas était si to themselves? Why couldn't these ideas de be communicated to the masses? Par Pourquoi ces idées ne pouvaient-elles pas être communiquées aux masses? This is part of the 
I was going to say the general thing of, of, of secrecy. Uh, secrecy was one of the key principles. Uh, of the Communist Party of Kampuchea. Uh, knowledge was only for those who needed to have it. And, uh, right the way through, in, in right up to the end, the Vietnamese invasion and uh, the flight of the Khmer Rouge from Phnom Penh, everything they did was marked by extraordinary secrecy. So the fact that Q Song Phan said, uh, no, keep this to yourselves, don't tell the masses, pour soi, de ne pas le dire aux masses. whether it was because the masses would be discouraged, uh, that I think is less important. Non, ça, the point Mais is, keep it to yourselves, do not let it out. De dire, That's cela pour vous, ne absolutely pas fundamental to everything filtrée. they did. Ça, so if I understand you faisait. correctly, the, the, the instruction or the request is, is a furtherance of a policy or a, or a, or a line of, a, of, of the party. Du party and correct me if I've got that wrong. Corrigez-moi le cas échéant. I suppose you could say a policy, a, a, a line, a, a, a guiding principle would be the best, I think. Thank you. I'm grateful for that. Now, as I said, we, we are going to try and deal with things chronologically um, in, in, in trying to um, uh, understand in a bit more detail the development of, of policies and, and structures of the CPK. So I'm going to take us right back to 1960, um, and your book is extremely detailed uh, in, in, this, in this period. Uh, there are a lot of very interesting developments that you describe. Um, but just by way of a very, very brief overview, and you will correct me if I've got this wrong, but from trompe, approximately 1950 onwards, dire a, a a a communist, uh, you describe the development of a, of a, vous of a, a, le a, a communist uh, movement, un movement uh, communiste within Cambodia under the general Cambodge, sponsorship of the Vietnamese, qui était parrainé um, par les Vietnamiens. and you described the various committees, uh, the city committees that, that uh, existed throughout the 1950s, the Urban Committee and the Phnom Penh Committee. Um, and in fact, you described that, uh, Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia both, both joining. I believe Pol the urban et de Nuncia, uh, qui était membre du comité de la ville, la comté de 55, d'après uh, ce que vous dites, me semble-t-il. You then describe the, Ensuite, the the Congress, the 1960 September 1960 Congress, Congress. Um, and and the reason I start here is because si I think you describe it as, as, as a significant event, as an event that, un that uh, important. Uh, presents a number of uh, important decisions. Lors and if I can quote here from the book, this passage un starts from page 137, and then it follows on the next two pages of your book, uh, the ERNs in English, 00396337, in French, 00639617. And you described a gathering of 21 delegates uh, at the home of an individual called, called Ox Kun. And you sp state that they met for three days Vous dites que la a duré jours. and that during that time they remained all in the one place. Et que and I'll quote you here tous as to au même the importance of this meeting. Vous parlez de l'importance de la réunion. Quote, but the program approved by the Mais meeting marked a crucial first step towards an independent political line. Vers une ligne the feudal ruling class led by Sihanouk, they declared, par far Sihanouk, from playing a positive role, role as the Vietnamese argued, positive, was the most Vietnamien, important enemy of the Kampuchean revolution, de la revolution and a tool of the American imperialists. The plight of the Cambodian people was two or three times worse than before 1955, when Hanoi had imposed the policy of cooperating with Siam. Cambodians would therefore have to struggle to annihilate the feudal regime, peacefully or otherwise. Can I ask you to expand on, on the significance of this decision, and in particular in light of the point you make that Hanoi had in fact imposed a, a different policy, a policy of cooperating with CNN. This whole period, and I, I don't want to get ahead of your, your questioning, but right from 
the, the, the start, dépasser le cadre uh, de votre question, with the mais Isarac, dès le début, uh, rebellion dès against the French in the late 40s, right the way through the late 60s, et jusqu'à la fin des années 60, pendant toute cette période, is a period of période, a very gradual step by step disengagement by the Cambodian communists from the Vietnamese, and and the reason. Two main reasons. Il y a deux raisons First of all, the Vietnamese wished to be seen and regarded themselves as elder brothers, uh, bringing on the younger Cambodian brothers and controlling what they did. Petits frères and uh, et les right up to 1960, that essentially remained the case. It began to change in 1960 when the Cambodians held their own congress without inviting Vietnamese delegates, without telling the Vietnamese party what they were doing. That was a, a crucial first step towards the independence of the Cambodian Communist Party. The, the second element was that the Vietnamese and the Cambodians had very different interests. For the Vietnamese, Sihanouk, who was neutralist, who was sympathetic, and indeed at many times, many points uh, in, in that period, fundamentally believed that whatever the Americans might do, the Vietnamese communists were going to win, and he had to make policy accordingly. So for the Vietnamese, Sihanouk was objectively an ally, a very useful person to have. For the Cambodian communists, uh, Prince Sihanouk and his government, uh, which increasingly uh, res restricted any possibility of opposition, a legitimate legal opposition, that regime was the enemy. So you had two different approaches, two different sets of interests. Thank you, and I think we will return to that theme that's divergence that you're describing. Another quote from, from that same section, and if you're looking at the hard copy, this will be at page 138. You describe the election of a new leadership, and you say the following. The Congress elected a new leadership. Toussaint became secretary, with Nunchia as his deputy, and Salot Sa in the third ranking position. All three were full members of the standing committee. Du comité Ying Siri, whose Ying only real qualification was to have headed the Circle Marxist in Paris, Paris, was promoted over the heads of the former resistance leaders to become fourth in the hierarchy, a striking demonstration of the growing power of the returned students. And that's the that last part is what I'm particularly interested in, um, because you discussed yesterday Hier, the importance effet, of intellectuals within the leadership of the party. Um, party. Does this rise or a growing cette influence ascension, that you describe, growing power of returned students, does that, is, the, is this a, a significant point in time? Uh, where that begins to be seen, or, or does that happen at some other quelque point chose in time? qui commence précisément à ce moment-ci? I think it's fair to say this this was one of the um, marking one of the, the, the significant uh, periods or occasions where one saw the return students become more important. Because in the 1950s, uh, the, um, the, the party was still essentially uh, former Isaraks. Uh, to Samut, uh, in the countryside, people like Kaipok, uh, Sopum. Uh, now we get to 1960 in the standing committee, uh, three, the three full members, there is no Isarak leader. Uh, well, to Samut, yes, but then uh, Nuanchia was from a very small group of Thai trained. Cambodian communists, Pol Pot, a return student, Ng Suri, a return student, and really only one rural warlord, So Pol. So the balance is already changing, and it would change further, though there would always be these 
you can say three groups, uh, essentially two groups. Uh, later, they were called the brick houses and the thatched houses. In other words, the urban return students and the Isarak from the countryside, plus Nuenchir and one or two others who didn't have very much significance, who were the Thai group, but was very tiny. Thank you. And, and while we're dealing with this uh, period, uh, you don't date this particular event, uh, but I, I, I gather from the context that it would be late 50s and early 60s. Um, we're looking here at page 132 of the book, uh, and the ERNs are in English 00396332, French 00639611. You're dealing here with uh, the activities of Q Sampan in a period, and what is of some relevance to the, our present discussion is that you say the following, quote, With Sari's encouragement, he had followed Hu Yun's example and joined the San Kun, but then to the dismay of his elderly mother, who expected him to begin a lucrative career as a high official, he invested his savings in a stock of lead type and began producing a twice-weekly broadsheet. And then this, his assignment from the underground Phnom Penh City Committee was to rally intellectual support and reach out to potential communist sympathizers in mainstream political life. It was a role to which Sampan was well suited. Do I understand correctly from that passage then that, and you will correct me on the timing of things if I've got this wrong, late in the 50s, perhaps following Q. Sampan's return or early 60s, based on your research, the facts you've gathered, there was already contact between uh, Q. Sampan and that underground Phnom Penh City Committee. Yes, we're talking early 60s, right at the beginning of the 1960s. Um, and yes, there, there was contact. Now, direct contact, uh, with whom, how, that's a very different question, because there are, in, in, in uh, the Sihanoukist weekly Réalité Cambodgienne, there is an extraordinary description um, of how, uh, during that sort of time, uh, the uh, the the Communist City Committee, uh, Vaughan Vett in particular, disguised his contacts through very large numbers of intermediaries. So direct contact, one can't say, but certainly um, uh, indirect contact. And uh, if, I, if I might just add, there was a, a little bit you, you didn't read that followed. It said Q. Uh, Sampan was well suited for this role. He was an idealist in whom personal morality and social conscience were indissolubly linked. And I think that is going slightly outside your question, but it seems to be important. Um, uh, Q. Sampan was, no, that still is, rigid, doctrinaire, but um, uh, very um, consistent. Uh, he uh, was, at that time, an upright man and he continued to hold uh, without asking himself too many questions to what he believed in. Now, without asking himself very many questions, of course, is the downside of those characteristics I've described. Thank you. But to confirm, we sort of focused on the on the mode of contact. Um, but I did understand correctly then from that passage that there was assignment given to him uh, from this underground city committee. Yes, you did, and apologies for my digression. Réponse, oui, en effet, vous l'avez euh, bien compris, et euh, je regrette si 
your book is, 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 is full of extremely interesting detail and uh, I regret to, to, to have to um, skip some of it, uh, but, but we're, we're trying to be as, as economical as we can with the time and just keep on the main events I'm going to fast forward then to 1964 uh, and you're looking at the hard copy, so you're at this point we're at page 146, you had already testified yesterday about the, the, the initial change of name, so that, that has already happened at this point in time. Um, the reason I, I, I pause at this point and I want to ask you a couple of questions is because you're describing a perhaps a, a shift or, or, a, or a further movement uh, in, in this uh, move towards a freedom from Vietnamese control, and, and you will correct me if I'm summarizing these things wrong. Um, at this point, of course, 1964, uh, the, the, some of the leaders have already fled Phnom Penh and, and they're in, in Vietnam. So looking at page 146, the ERN is being 00, 396, 346 in English and 00, 639, 630 in French. It's essentially the first Central Committee meeting since 1963. And you say the following, the first concrete sign of that, that being an independent stance, came in the autumn when an enlarged plenum of the Central Committee, the first such meeting the Cambodians had ever held, took place in a forest on the Cambodian side of the border. It lasted several weeks and ended by producing a draft resolution which endorsed all forms of struggle, including armed violence, against Sihanouk's government and emphasized self-reliance, the Khmer's code word for freedom from Vietnamese control. And just to be complete, I will read from the next page where that draft resolution was put in its final form. You say the following. In January 1965, the Central Committee met again to put the resolution into its final form. The version approved by the second plenum attacked modern revisionism, meaning Khrushchev's ideas about peaceful transition to socialism, and affirmed the role of revolutionary violence in the struggle against imperialism and its lackeys. To the Khmer's, Sihanouk was just such a lackey a chieftain of the feudalists and imperialists, wreaking terror on the Cambodian people. Does this represent a, a, a significant development? Is it a shift or, or a further movement towards a policy of independence? Um, I'll start with that first. It's a further step in this incremental series of movements towards independence, yes. The endorsement of violence in the struggle against imperialism and its lackeys, including Sia, does that have any significance from the perspective of, of evolution of policy or, or principles by the party? It's more explicit than what they've said before, uh, but they had talked about all forms of struggle um, uh, earlier on. So now you're saying armed violence, revolutionary violence, uh, modern revisionism, Khrushchev's ideas about the parliamentary road to, to power. Well, Sihanouk had closed that off because he was not willing to uh, allow a space for the opposition. So in a way, uh, to some extent, they were forced into uh, using violence because that was the only option available. But yes, and we will come to it in a minute, I'm sure, uh, it would then uh, lead to revolutionary violence. Thank you. Another development um, that seems to be occurring at this point in time is a view of countryside vis-à-vis -vis the city, uh, and some of the difficulties that the party was experiencing uh, in, your, in your description um, in, in recruiting cadre in the cities. 
this is at page 149, and the ERNs are 0639632, French 0639649. And the quote is as follows. The Cambodian party's inability to penetrate the country's nascent proletariat was to have far-reaching consequences. Sa and his colleagues did not ask themselves what they were doing wrong. Instead, in a pattern of behavior that would be repeated whenever they were faced with failure, by 1965, they decided that the factories had been infiltrated and the workers transformed into enemy agents. From then on, factory workers were systematically refused admission to the party. Can I ask you to expand on, on, on that phenomenon? of inability to infiltrate factories and, and what you describe as an evolving view vis-à-vis -vis the cities and workers? I think at this stage it, it was particularly a view of, of the working class, the proletariat. Um, if you look at other communist parties, Without exception, they have recruited among the proletariat. Uh, the whole raison d'être of, of, of communism, and of a, a Marxist approach to policy, as, as Marx proclaimed it, uh, was based on industry, on the Industrial Revolution. And uh, the, the Cambodian communists took the view that the workers had basically been bought off by the bosses, that they were not reliable. And instead of asking themselves why, uh, they, as, I, as you've read, uh, they took the view that they had been infiltrated. And this was a systematic pattern because we see later, uh, instead of asking themselves after 1975 what was going wrong in the Cambodian countryside, why they were not getting uh, the yields that they expected, why they were not, agricultural production was not developing as expected, they put it all down to sabotage by Vietnamese agents. So, so this mindset, the principles must be right. Therefore, if they're not working, they're being sabotaged by outside. Uh, that was already present in the 1960s. Thank you. We then move forward to uh, the 1966 period and elections that took place in 1966, following which uh, Lon Nol formed a government that's been described as a right-wing government. And here, the Central Committee uh, makes uh, certain decisions or, or resolutions with respect to that government. Um, and I'm only quoting here, again, because I, I, I wish to uh, ask you as to whether or not this is, is a further development of relevance. This starts at page one. It's, it's at page 164. The English ERN is 00396364 and French 00639669. The background to this passage is the developments uh, in Indonesia and the fate of the Indonesian Communist Party, but we're going to look at what the, uh, the policy or the principles were or implications were for the CPK. Quote, the, lessons, the lesson for Saar was that bourgeois, the bourgeoisie could not be relied on. The Vietnamese strategy was wrong. It was not possible for the communists to live together with Sihanouk because the contradictions between them were too deep. Policy towards non-party sympathizers was therefore modified. In theory, the guideline remained to unite 
unite with all those who could be united with. But in practice, the movement behaved more and more as though all those who were not with us are against us. Kyu Sampan, Hu Yun and Hu Nim, who had kept their seats in the September elections, began to distance themselves from the prince. It marked the start of the politics of exclusion that would become one of the hallmarks of the Cambodian party's style. From now on, the CPK required its supporters to draw a clear line of demarcation between the enemy and ourselves. So we heard in your previous response a description of this refusal to look to one's own actions for, with a critical eye, perhaps. And now we look at we, we have this uh, uh, further uh, development, it appears, of a principle with respect to those outside uh, being viewed as enemies. Do I take it correctly then that this is another development and that there is a thread which then follows uh, in, in, in the years after? It's another increment, and yes, I think one of the most striking things is when you look back uh, at the way the party developed, there is a very clear thread with this event happening and then another event, and it all moves it on, but always in the same sense. And I think your book uh, paints a picture. Uh, in, in, in a very nice and detailed manner. Just returning to this passage, you state that Kyu Sampan and Hu Yun and Hu Nim began to distance themselves from the prince. Mindful of the fact that this is late 1966, presumably, and that Pol Pot, part of the leadership, had already left Phnom Penh. Do, do I infer correctly from that passage that there is still some degree of uh, communication, cooperation? I'll let you use, uh, use the, the, the words that you think appropriate. But you, you seem to describe a, an action on the part of Kyu Sampan that is consistent with this evolution. Consistent with is a good way of putting it. Uh, one of the difficulties um, is to know exactly how the interface between Kyu Sampan, Hu Nim and Hu Yun and the CPK core, the city committee, how that operated, how the links worked, but that there was a linkage in the way they, they operated is certain. Thank you. And just to follow up on this, and, and please, if you, if you think I'm taking you into the realm of speculation, then simply don't answer. Um, do I take it from your previous response um, that there is a a connection between the action of these men in Phnom Penh and, and what is being decided in the countryside. There is, in other words, these were not sporadic events that occurred divorced from one another and happened to just be happening at the same time. No, they were certainly not sporadic and divorced from each other. Uh, but to go from there to saying there was a direct linkage, uh, I, I, I think it's probably not correct, but it's certainly a step one can't take. Thank you. En tout cas, on ne peut pas se prononcer là-dessus. Now, I'm going to disappoint you a little bit and, and skip the uprising, um, simply because uh, it has been covered to a degree, and uh, perhaps it, 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 we, might, we might deal with it uh, as part of other topics. Um, but I, I will uh, fast forward a little bit and uh, deal with events in 1970. Uh, and, and here, uh, we've already heard uh, some evidence from you as, as to the creation of the uni United Front coalition with, with Sihanouk, so I will not rehash that. Um, but I wish to focus on another aspect 
of, of, of this period or another series of events. And if you're looking at the book, the relevant passages are at page 202, and then it actually continues all the way to, 2000, to 205. What you're describing there is, a, is, is, I think, a challenge, and you will, again, you will correct me if I've got this wrong, arising from military victories that at this point in time are being attained by the Vietnamese forces, and a challenge that in your, your view, if I've got this right, that this poses for the communist leadership in Cambodia. And you describe that the Vietnamese had, by this stage, already occupied several provinces of Vietnamese forces, that is. At page, I think this is at 204, English ERN 00396 404 and French 00639719. You say the following. For Saar and his colleagues, this posed a real dilemma. On the one hand, the more territory the Vietnamese seized, the more recruits there would be for the resistance army and the bigger the liberated zones for the Khmer Rouges to administer. On the other hand, the CPK leaders were acutely aware of the danger of going too fast. Quote, they told us in effect, end of quote, a Vietnamese historian wrote later, Quote, if you, our brothers, help us to do everything too quickly, we won't be able to keep up with you, and then the moment you leave, we will have nothing. On page 205, I'll just read a very brief passage from this, so this is the next page, uh, you say the following, the ancestral dread of Vietnamese domination shared by Sihanouk and Lon Nol emerged in 1970 as one of the driving forces of CPK policy. Would you care to expand on this? Uh, and have I got the first quote right? Is it, is it of relevance uh, in the sense that the, 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 the victories in the battlefield by the Vietnamese posed a challenge for the, for the Khmer Rouge leadership? But if I understand your uh, description of this correctly, that that was driven again by a fear of, of Viet Vietnamese domination. There, there was, uh, yes, there was a fear of Vietnamese domination, that, and that was very important. But I think one has to remember that in, at the time of the coup, there were only about 2,000, and that, even that may be a, a, you know, an optimistic estimate, 2,000 uh, Cambodian guerrillas uh, fighting against uh, Lon Nol's uh, forces. It's a very small number. Um, if uh, the, the imbalance between those 2,000, even if new recruits were flocking in, they weren't trained, they weren't integrated, the imbalance between the Khmer forces and the very well-trained, battle-hardened uh, Vietnamese uh, detachments who had moved into Cambodia and were occupying large areas of Cambodian territory was enormous. So even without the ancestral, what I've called the ancestral fear of Vietnamese domination, the, the Pol Pot had a real problem. You know, how, how do we uh, keep our end up? How do we hold up uh, uh, our flag uh, if we are so few and there are so many and there's such a huge area? But added to that, the Vietnamese did many things which reawakened old fears of domination. Uh, I mean, most obviously, the suggestion that they should have mixed commands and the uh, Vietnamese officers with uh, Khmer officers supporting them. Uh, all these things were, were red flags to Pol Pot and, and the 
Cambodians. Uh, so the two things came together, the practical aspect and the fear of Vietnamese domination, which you, know, you, you look back to 1954 when the Cambodians have been doing very, really not badly. Um, uh, the Geneva Conference came, uh, the Vietnamese did a very nice deal for themselves, and the poor Cambodian Isaraka kind of left high and dry. This had happened before. Thank you, and we probably will be returning to, to this uh, issue of relationship with, with Vietnam um, as, we, as we go forward. Um, but I think going chronologically, uh, you describe another phenomenon or, or, um, or development. This is at page 210, and at this point, of course, we're in 1970, so the civil war is, is underway. Uh, the English ERN here is 0039641010 and French 0039726227. You say the following. The slide over the edge of reason into the abyss was not confined to the regime in Phnom Penh. If to Lon Nol's government, all Vietnamese were communists, to the Khmer Rouge, all foreigners were enemies. By the end of April, 26 Western journalists had gone missing in Cambodia. Those fortunate enough to end up in the hands of the Viet Cong were usually freed, as was the practice in Vietnam, at a moment of maximum political advantage to their captors. With three exceptions, all those captured during the war by the Khmer Rouge, priests and aid personnel, as well as journalists, were killed. Once again, it was a matter of drawing a clear line of demarcation between the enemies, enemy and ourselves. Uh, is that a further increment or development in, in, the, in the view we were discussing earlier uh, as to enemies and ourselves and the treatment of that enemy? Whether it's a development or whether it's simply the continuation of the same thing, because we, we talked earlier about after 1966, after the Long Nol government came to power, uh, the Khmer Rouge or the, the, the CPK increasingly took the view all who are not with us are against us. Well, all who are not with us are against us means clear line between the enemy and ourselves. It, it's all of a package, I think. Were those questions? President, thank you, the prosecutor, and thank you, Mr. Expert. The time is appropriate for a short break. We will take a 20 minute break and return at 10 to 11. Court officer, could you assist the expert during the break? and have him return to the courtroom at 10 to 11. The court is now adjourned.